Good afternoon, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda this morning, a public briefing on the subject of 3D printing. Before we begin, let me acknowledge that uh, we're missing Commissioner Feldman on the dais today. Unfortunately, he can't be here in person, but he's participating by phone, I hope, and we'll try to check on that and make sure we have a clear connection. Peter, are you there? Uh, he's watching, okay. Oh, that's fine. So he'll email you questions. If, oh, okay, that's great. <laughs> I think that works. This meeting is the first in what I hope will be a series of public meetings to provide greater transparency into the work of the Consumer Product Safety Commission and of our staff. Um, and in particular, our staff in the Office of Hazard Reduction and Analysis, which we affectionately refer to as EXHR. 3D printing is not currently on our regulatory agenda as an active rulemaking, but it is an emerging technology our staff is paying close attention to, and I'll note is a newly active voluntary standard for Commission staff participation in the FY20 operating plan. Today's briefing provides a snapshot of staff's knowledge at this time, and I know there will be more to come in the future. We're going to start with staff's presentation, followed by rounds of questions by the commissioners. I will call on each commissioner in order of seniority. We'll start with five-minute rounds, but we'll aim to be flexible, and we'll go as many rounds as needed. Today, we're going to hear from Rick McCallion, Program Area Risk Manager for me me Mechanical, Recreational Sports, and uh, my favorite topic, Seniors. Uh, he's joined by Dwayne Boniface, uh, and, uh, who is the Assistant Executive Director for Hazard Reduction and Analysis. Thank you for being here this afternoon, um, and you may begin. Okay, well, I'd like to thank the Commission for giving me the opportunity to come speak with you about 3D printing. It's a pretty interesting topic. Um, with that, I'm Rick McCallion, I'm Program Area Risk Manager for the um, Risk Management Group of EXHR. I'm one of five uh, Program Area Risk Managers, along with Susan Bathlon, Rick Khanna, Doug Lee, and Dr. Trey Thomas. Unfortunately, Dr. Thomas is not a, uh, able to be here today. He is in Boulder at NIST at a 3D conference looking at emissions. He's not snowed in? Is uh, He may very well be. <laughs> I, I haven't heard from him, so it's very possible. Okay. Um, and our division is run by Patty Adair, who is just an awesome boss. Also in our group is uh, Patty Edwards and Scott Ayers working on voluntary standards stuff. And um, we have our FOIA and product safety assessment coordinator, Dean LaRue, is also in our group. So with that, um, I just want to lay kind of the groundwork, no pun intended, on what 3D printing is and why we're, you know, why, why it's on our radar. So when we think about what um, 3D printing is, it's just basically another manufacturing process along with a whole bunch of others that have been for around for a while. But the difference, um, the, what makes 3D printing different, and I'll use my cup as an example, is it's building products from the ground up, basically, or, or parts from the ground up. So what you do is you, you have a program, a computer program, that takes a, an image of, of a product and will slice it into a whole bunch of thin slices. And then it'll send, uh, it'll send those slices to a printer, layer by layer, one by one, and the printer will lay down a small bead that outlines the, that profile of that, that image in, in that layer. So it's basically a 2D image that eventually builds into a 3D product. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that come make 3D printing really desirable, uh, a really desirable manufacturing process. Um, I think as of 2017, it was a $7.4 billion business, so it's pretty, it's pretty substantial. Um, and that was up from about $6.1 billion in 2016. And they're expecting, in over, I think over the next couple of years, probably a 20 to 25% year over year increase. I'm guessing that'll drop off eventually as, as it becomes more saturated. But um, the products themselves are relatively cheap. You can get a pen, and we'll have some uh, images of them later, but a really simple, very basic 3D printer, which is the shape of a pen. Um, that's about $50, and the more traditional printer-looking-like printers that look like your home printer, sort of the little boxy shape, they start around $200, and then they go up from there. They, rent, they can go way up to probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars at the higher end of those. Um, the, as far as the design and what, uh, one of the desirabilities of 3D printing, 
they allow for designs that aren't aren't possible in any other way. So I had a I have a prop here that I, I'll be more than happy to pass around because it's a little small. I got it at a trade show, but basically what it is is it's four balls. This is about the size of a cat ball. I apologize for the size. Um, but with any other process, you couldn't make this this way. So it was made all as one, all at once, and all the balls inside each other as one piece. And because of the physical limitations of the traditional processing method, you wouldn't be able to make that just in that way. Um, one of the limitations of it early on were the print speed. Now with new technology and new processes. Actually, would you oh, mind sharing Absolutely. that with us? I would like to see it. So print speeds are, are, are increasing. That one of the limitations to the uh, technology was that print speeds are really slow. So you could make a really small product, but it would take, uh, pro uh, you know, have a really small product, say this cap, but it may take three or four hours. Anything bigger, like this water bottle, could take up to 24 hours to print. Now you can print out about 100 of these in probably an hour. The, the, the time has really come, come, come up, uh, come down fast. Um, one of the other things that, that um, that we're seeing is that's being used in places like schools and libraries, and we'll touch on and we'll get into that a little bit more because that has some other implications. And we're seeing that small businesses are adapting these due to the ease of use and the cost. They're very portable, they're easy to install, they're easier to use. Um, and we're seeing that through um, things like bank loans that are being made available to small manufacturers for buying printing products. So overall, we're basically expecting you know to see a lot more consumer products uh, show it up that use 3D printing technology and, and methods. Um, so like I said, I think I mentioned earlier, it started kind of as a promotional and prototyping process, um, but it's grown to where any, just about anything can be 3D printed now. We still see a lot of promotional products and customizable gifts because you can write names and stuff on them relatively easy, but we're seeing other things show up in the market like bike helmets and, and as we can see here, some other shoes and containers and stuff like that and toys. There are some special issues with toys that, that, um, that, that are definitely a concern. Um, and things aren't just limited in size anymore. They can, they can be basically printed in any size or any material, basically. You can, we've, we're starting to see things like bridges and houses, which thankfully aren't consumer products. But um, the, the, the scale is not a limiting factor anymore. They're, they're, um, there's just about, like I said, anything that can be printed any size. So to get into the terminology a little bit, um, one of the things we're seeing is that there's different different groups and different industries use different terminology. Um, I think we took this from NIOSH or OSHA. I think we were using it for that, but our I th our view is a little different. So um, I'll give you your, our our kind of interpretation or my personal interpretation of some of these things. Starting with uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing, they're kind of interchangeable terms. Um, for our purposes, for staff, when, when I, for example, when Trey and I talk about stuff, we use 3D printing for the smaller home type environment and additive manufacturing for the more industrial. But that's not a hard and fast, it's just kind of our way of determining. For the most part, it's, they're interchangeable terms. I think for, for the purposes of here, we'll probably stay with 3D printing, although additive manufacturing, if I drop that in, it's, it's, it's a synonymous term, basically. Um, large scale and, and small scale manufacturing, there's no clear dif the differentiation between which the two, but I would suggest that we use, that small scale would be something that would be able to fit on a desktop or a tabletop that's relatively portable. Um, large scale being the ones that are the room size or something that's gonna be taking up a lot more room. Um, small scale are probably more likely to be used in the home environment, but that's not to say that large industries aren't using them. So what we're starting to see is, is they're being marketed as a way of increasing production, number of production units. So you could have a large manufacturer have, dedicate a whole bunch of, of, uh, of floor space in manufacturing floor space to small printers that are effectively the size of your home printer and just line them up down the floor so that they, could, they can print out more products at a given time. Um, large scale printers, they're pretty much limited to larger, larger applications and larger industries just because of the cost, the size. And they, the, the large-scale printers also have more capabilities. They're more likely to have the higher, the higher technology, so they, they may have better surface finishes. They're probably more likely to have the more advanced techniques to use to print like metal parts and that type of stuff. Um, so they're more likely to, to be in that environment. But it is possible that we see them in, in smaller locations, like a strip mall down the street from you. If a home user wanted to print them, there's a possibility that they could, uh, they could have like what I call like the Kinko's effect, where you print something, you, you have a design at home that you want to print, but it's, it's beyond the capacity of what you have in your home. You could send it down to that, 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 um, that business down the street, and they have a, has a larger printer and does that. So it's kind of like a shared, a, a shared application for that. 
So to jump back to small scale printing for just a second, um, what we're seeing is, is these, print, these, these printers popping up in, in schools and libraries and other public places where a lot of kids are being exposed to them. Um, they're being incorporated into to, uh, STEM education curriculums. And um, anecdotally, I've talked to, I think since I've been prepping for this and a little bit before that, every person I talk to that has knowledge of this, that has younger kids or the kids in school say, oh yeah, my kid has worked on one or my child has, has been exposed to one or we know they're in the school. So they're, they, they seem like they're, they're really becoming a, a, part of, a part of the school environment and we see them in libraries for, for general consumer use, but um, I would expect it also be uh, child exposure in that, that, that area too. But I think it's fair to say that we would expect every child going forward, as, as this technology uh, continues to go forward, uh, continues to advance, every child uh, we would expect to be exposed to 3D printing and then the potential, uh, potential hazards that poten are, are attributed with that. Okay, so distributed manufacturing is another area for that, that's kind of big in 3D printing. And it's, it's basically moving the part or product production to place of production out closer to the end use. So what we see from the manufacturing, from the large manufacturing standpoint is they, it, I guess it's an economical, for economical reasons if nothing else, they, they, can, they can do their part production where they either need to assemble it or where the point of sale is going to be or close. It also gives them the opportunity to reduce standing inventory. So they're making it as needed. They don't have to have, they don't have to produce a bunch of, bunch of parts that they hope they can sell. They can produce them as they need it when somebody orders them or when they need them to put them in to, to build a finished product. Um, the, other, the other part of distributed manufacturing is, is, the, um, is, the, is the fact that these, these, um, these smaller local manufacturers don't necessarily need to be associated or to be part of the big industry. They could be home manufacturers that are contracting or small businesses. So somebody theoretically could be pr producing parts for a large manufacturer out of their basement or again down in the strip mall at a, at a small business type facility. It's not just limited to a, a large manufacturer that has their own production, their, their own small scale production somewhere else, although that is very possible. And I would, I would say that's probably where we're, how we're seeing it right now, at least, uh, again, anecdotally. So I just wanted to touch on the, the actual types of 3D printers, printers and printer technology there are. There's approximately 10 of them out there now. I may have missed a couple and they may, they, because it's changing so much. I'm not going to get into the specifics. I'd be more than happy to talk to them, talk to each one. But um, I just wanted to cover the fact that most of the decisions about which printer to use is based on the material you're printing. So you'd want a certain type of printer if you're, if you're printing metals or if you're printing stainless, there's a certain type of printing that would use for that. If you're printing concrete, there would, you wouldn't want to use a, an old, you know, a, a small, a small um, stereolithography type system. Um, so that's kind of the, the first decision. The first um, point of decision making is what material you're gonna, uh, are you going to produce? And then basically what kind of product are you going to make it for? Do you have to have a good finish? Can it be a rough finish? Because typically most of the printers give you a fairly rough far finish, at least the mid scale to lower scale ones are going to, they're not going to give you a nice clean surface finish or something or durability pro, you know, there's durability issues and all those other problems with it. So you may want a, a higher end or a different process that can give you a better, a, a better, fun, a better part at the end. Um, the speed of the, the speed of the production, if you're actually, if you want to produce a, a more than one at a time and you have a time limit, then, then speed is, um, I touched on quality. Um, um, obviously, the size is a problem, is, is an issue because um, most of the most of the consumer grade printers are going to be the desktop size, and the, the the beds are about, you know, I would say less than 48 inches roughly, so 48 inches square, 40 inches cube, so that's probably on the big side, the more like probably 24, um, and all of that feeds into the cost. So all those all those benefits come with a cost. The higher the <clears throat> the higher the technology, the more advanced the technology, most likely the higher the cost. So with that. We can sort of get into the hazards a little bit, and we broke them down into two ways because 3D printing is somewhat unique in that we have hazards associated with actually the printing process in 3D printers, especially when they're in the home environment or that type of non-industrial or small industrial environment. And then we have the 3D printed parts and what they're producing and the hazards associated with them. So we're going to break them down in, in each of the program areas by that. So the first is the fire and combustion hazards. And when we look at the printers, one of the problems we, we see with them is for just about every process in there, we're, we're, um, we're required to melt the material to 
a semi-liquid or liquid form to, to actually make it flow through the nozzle to make it to actually print out the part. So we need pr relatively high temperatures. Um, so there's, with that, with those high temperatures, associated with those high temperatures, always at the risk of fire. We could have a fire. Also, given the fact that these are kind of long-term processes and they're sort of somewhat self-contained, so you put in your, pro you know, you, you design your, your, uh, your product and you send it to the printer and you leave it. And there's no, I, I would say reasonably, that there, there's no short turnaround. It's going to take a while for that to print, even the smallest products. So there's a good possibility that you're just going to start printing it and do something else. You're not going to stand there and watch it. Um, so you have the possibility of it being, un or the, the likelihood that it's unsuper an unsupervised process. When we look at that from the consumer side and in the home environment, you could theoretically, or in actuality, put it in your basement or someplace where you would normally put a printer that's out of the way, that's that maybe a little cluttered or some stuff around it, and then just go off and do whatever. So there's certainly concerns about you know, about a fire hazard, and then if, if, if there's you know fire protection available, if there's something to protect that, if there's a smoke alarm covering that, um, to, to do any of that, because there, I, as far as I know, there's none of that safety stuff built in, fire protection safety built in. Um, I would say that there's, there's safety protocols built in. If something goes south on the, on the print, that would probably stop, but it may not, it's certainly not designed to detect, you know, ha hazard events like that. The other thing to consider is some of the processes is use uh, granules or powder. They are not just um, like the, the thread-fed type printers. So you could be dealing with um, um, a process that has a powder bed basically in the process which could create dust that um, again with the elevated temperatures could could become a combustion hazard or an explosion hazard so we have all those all those with fire and combustion and then when we start looking at the product we have the questions of how do we make sure that it's compliant to existing standards especially fire standards um, there's material compatibility and durability issues with um, how, how it's designed, who designed it, and whether it will withstand the, the rigors of actual operation in the fire in, in, in the fire and combustion zone. So um, if you're making a product, will it, will it provide that fire barrier or whatever that it was designed to do um, based on the material you picked, based on the design, and based on how, it was, how the printer actually made it, which we'll get into a little more about, the, about that in the mechanical side, um, how, the, how the, the, those have an effect. So the electric hazards are somewhat, somewhat similar. Um, we definitely have uh, the possibility of electrocution hazards because we think of the energy that's needed to melt some of those materials, especially when we start getting into, away from the plastics, into the more metals where we're looking at higher temperatures. I think that plastics probably we're looking at you know, 200 C maybe, 200 degrees Celsius, which is pretty substantially hot, and then you go up from there. If you think about what it takes to, to melt a metal, a ferrous material, it's, it's pretty, pretty hot. So you need a lot of energy going in there. So the, the electrical circuitry and everything else that provides that in, a, in a, uh, a printer that is may or may not be enclosed, may have open size, may have exposure or accessibility to those electrical components is certainly a hazard. Um, and those, those, uh, those also those electrical components also could um, result in, in a, fire, a, a fire potential hazard. As far as the, the product goes, um, it, flame retardants, UV inhibitors, and uh, mechanical boundaries that, that keep you protected or deny accessibility to the electrocution hazards or protect from fires. And it's like if we if you think of like a, a covers for your outlets and stuff like that, if they're, if they're 3D printed, that's great, but they may not provide the, the protection in a fire to reduce the or stop the propagation or whatever the thermal, thermal propagation would be. Chemical hazards. This is where I kind of miss Trey because this is his area. So Trey, hopefully he's 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 listening, and I, I don't make him cringe. Um, so the printers from the printers, there's the, a, certainly concern about the toxicity of raw materials and whether they're safe to use and handling. Because now we're looking at introducing an environment where which was traditionally. Uh, isolated in the manufacturing environment when we're making parts for 3D printers, especially on the home side and the small scale side again. Um, we have people that are being exposed to these powders, these raw, raw, raw powders and, and um, all kinds of other, other materials, raw materials that are being put into this and they're also being exposed to it while they're being printed. So again, we're, we may be off gaffing stuff that may not be the greatest. How we store this stuff, um, it, not only from a mechanical standpoint, but from the chemical standpoint, is very important. How we store this, you know, are they are they going to be, are we going to have inhalation hazards because we're storing powder somewhere, or something like that? The chemical release and accessibility for children. Where where are we storing this stuff? Is it a hazard if they were to ingest it, or if they were even to, to get it on their hands? Is it is it a problem? 
um, because some of the metals, especially some of the metals, when we get into the metals, and I would think plastics too, um, there's there's stuff that that is in that is in that raw material that makes it functional, um, that may be inaccessible when it's a finished product, but may certainly be, except you know, much more readily accessible when it's um, in its raw form. So when we look at the, the product and parts, again, it's, it, this is a kind of a recurring theme, the durability of parts and how will they break down? Will they, will they, uh, will they you know, start to, start to fail in an unsafe way? Will they, will they start to uh, um, de degrade in a way that, that's unsafe, especially things like UV and, and other little stuff? Um, so, so how they fail is certainly important and will, you know, things like nanotubes, I think, is a, is a concern. As far as children hazards, um, there's the obvious with the high temperatures of a burn hazard, the chemical exposure I think we've covered with the, the chemical, and the fact that they're not fully enclosed, that they're, um, again, referring back to the small scale and home and those type of environments, um, they're not typically ventilated um, and not being enclosed, what kind of, what kind of off-gassing is that, that process doing? So when we're melting those plastics, what kind of fumes are they, is, it per, is it presenting? When we're melting metals, same thing, what kind of, um, of, uh, of, of um, stuff is bad stuff is coming off of that. Um, as far as the, the, the printed materials themselves, there's a whole host of issues that come up with that, not the least of which is producing small parts. How do we control small parts in, in, in products that are, that are, are being, uh, being printed or, or made by, by, um, in, by the home environment? Um, specifically when we think about that is, you know, we see people making pacifiers, rattles, small balls, and toys especially are, are, personal, uh, are, are personal favorites of people, you know, making the little novelty toys and stuff. I see Star Wars figures are really popular now with all the, you know, that type of stuff, Marvel care. All those things that, that would, you know, would potentially be a, a, children's, a children's product that would fall under those regulations. How would they, how would that, how would that fall out? Um, we have concerns about raw materials and exposure to, to, to uh, phthalates, and especially when we're printing plastics, which is probably the most common materials that we're printing are, are, are plastics in the home environment right now. Um, metals are starting to filter down. I think we'll see those soon, sooner rather than later in, in, in everyday printers that are for home use, but um, right now it's basically, basically plastics that are, are, are the most common ones. Um, and then we have the, 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 the um, along with the, the toys of, of, of things that were, were, um, were producing replicas of unsafe products, um, specifically like toy guns would be a, an issue. So jumping into mechanical hazards. Um, mechanical hazards are primarily related, related to the products that are printed. Um, when, the, when the printer fails, it, from a mechanical standpoint, most likely would, fall, would fail in a fail-safe manner. From a mechanical standpoint, it could present a a fire hazard if, if, it, uh, if, it, if it failed in a certain way. I mean, it could overheat. Um, some of them use lasers, so that would certainly be a concern depending on how, how the, the, the laser is pointed. That, that would be an eye hazard or something like that. But um, I, um, I, I think primarily the, pro the, the, um, the, the areas of interest for mechanical are with the, 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 um, the finished products themselves. Um, and as I said before, the, the, the great thing about 3D printing is it allows designs that you couldn't previously do, but on the other side of it is 3D processing, because of the ease of the process and the way it's done, it also removes some of the expertise that's in the more traditional manufacturing process. So when you think of traditional manufacturing, you get a lot of the, um, the, the materials engineers that, that certify materials and provide the right materials for the right job and, and make sure that they're the right grade of materials and those type of things may be removed from the process. You have your design engineers, depending on where you get your design from. If you pull it off the internet, you know, you don't know who that person was, what their qualification was to be designing that product. So you take that out. And then we get to the actual, pro the building of the product is, how do you know the, the, the raw materials are, are any good? And specifically, the raw material, the properties of the raw materials are different from the final materials. So. Um, traditionally, when we're using traditional manufacturing processes, we kind of know what the material properties are in the finished product because we've, we've kind of defined the, the initial block or whatever we're using to make that product as opposed to building it from scratch. So we're finding, in, um, there's a lot of people doing research on this, that 3D printed parts have different properties. 
And specifically, the build, angle, the, the build direction also plays a factor in this. And this goes back, this is what I had mentioned earlier about flammability. It fi figures into all aspects. So if you were to build a product horizontally, so if you were to design, if you were to, to um, print this bottle standing up, you would possibly have different, different um, functional properties and thermal properties and a whole bunch of other things than if you would if you printed it on its side. Um, and that's a big concern, especially when you have, when, when, with the ease of production, if you take some of the expertise out of that, there may, that may not be the most obvious thing. It may be simpler to print it on its side because you don't have the vertical capacity in your printer. So um, all, these, all these different mechanical things are, 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 are kind of factor into this. And the, the last one, I guess, the, the kind of the catch-all is the QC, QA part of the process of who's going to be, who's going to be responsible for that on the home end and who's going to be doing that, who's going to have the knowledge to do that. Um, not only to know about that the, the product was, was used the right materials, the right process, the right design, but then that it was post-processed correctly because one of the, another one of the big areas that's coming up from on the industrial side is post-processing and how do you coat something to make it stronger, to make it, to, to heat treat it so that you don't have something that's really brittle when it should be bendable. So there's all those type of things um, that, that come in from the mechanical side of it. They touch on some of the staff ac activities related to research, engagement, and voluntary standards. Um, most of the research activities that we're engaged in at the moment are uh, related to emissions. Um, so we have some interagency inter agreements with uh, NIST, EPA, OSHA, and DOD, and they relate to uh, nanotubes, material toxicity, and some of the other um, health effects. Um, there's a lot of research going on in other areas, in mechanical areas, um, but I think those are the those are kind of where the first issues that we got to. We just haven't we, we kind of it's kind of filtering down. As far as staff engagement. Um, so we're, we're working with um, SDOs and, and, and developing potential letters for SDOs to kind of help fill in the gaps and make sure that they're, they're kind of um, um, covering the areas that we think are important. Um, we're working with some international agencies and groups. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the stuff which we'll, um, um, we'll get a little bit into with, with um, um, a couple of slides from now is um, a lot of the, the, technical, the technical side, the development of the technology is happening outside the U.S. So we're, we're working with some international partners specifically. I think um, Trey has, has been talking to our counterpart in Germany on how they're handling some of the, the emissions issues. And I've met with a couple of researchers from, from the UK who are doing some mechanical property, looking at mechanical properties uh, of, of printed products. Um, we hosted a, a federal interagency meeting in August. And as recently, I believe it was last week, maybe in the week before that, um, my, my schedule's a little bit squirrely. Um, we had UL come in and speak with us about their polymer research, and they did a great job of talking about the, um, the build direction problem that they've seen. Um, that's one of the, the, the big problems they have with thermal, thermal issues in, in 3D printed parts is how the, it's, it's a big factor in how the, the part is made as far as how the beads are laid down and a lot of technical issues with the actual process and specifically how it's, how, it's, um, <clears throat> how it's oriented when it's built. So they actually have, um, they certify materials on, with specifics of, of direction, build direction. So you have to, if you go to UL and try to get a specific product with a specific um, um, material, you have to tell them what direction you'd actually be building that in, so. Voluntary standards activities, there's a, actually, it's, there's a lot of good work going on in the voluntary standard standards worlds and we're working with the UL on various SCPs on emissions and electrical equipment. So I believe that the emissions is specific to 3D and then we're starting to see things like filter in the 3D stuff, the 3D process and accommodating that into, into specific standards like these, the electrical equipment because that's kind of where it's kind of popping up first in the industrial market. Industrial with like covers I would assume and stuff like that, outlet covers and things like that. Um, in 2000, I think 17, ASTM started the Center of Excellence for th uh, that related to 3D printing, and they're looking at um, 3D uh, st uh, standards that standardize the 3D printing processes, um, and they're really heavily influenced by the aerospace industry, FDA and DOD, where they're um, they're printing metal parts. So a lot of their work is with specific with a lot of titanium standards and stuff like that. But because the obvious concerns with putting um, um, 
a 3D part into an airplane, a commercial airplane, they're they're really heavily involved with making sure that the the standards for a specific process are well defined. And it, that's starting to filter down. They're starting to work on. They they just recently started a task group for consumer products, which we're going to be involved with. So. Um, I believe that's associated with the F F42, which is a fatigue group, the STM F42 ISO slash ISO. It's a um, it's a joint group that I believe they're they they claim, and I Patty Patty Edwards would be able to verify this that they have the first ASTM ISO standard, joint standard, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, the ANSI Amer Amer uh, America makes roadmap um, put out a report that um, basically described the state of 3D printing, where it was, and identified the holes, the, the research holes, where that we, we should be spending, or where the, the, um, the industry should be spending their time, and the researchers are spending their time looking, and what the, you know, the, what questions they should be trying to answer, and what work we've done. And I think that was, uh, that may have been as, much, as long as a year ago now. I'm not exactly sure when that came out, but um, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work, upfront work that's being done now as we start to get more into this. Um, it's not as well as, like I said, as well developed as some of the other uh, manufacturing areas. But I think there, there's just a lot of good work that's trying to get it to that point. So some of the challenges and opportunities that we are facing right now is, as I again mentioned a little bit earlier, the international collaboration. We see a lot of the tech being developed in in um, in Europe and Asia, and a lot of the manufacturing the the app, app, adoption and use of the products is being done in the U.S. So the 3D printing is being done here in a uh, home, industrial, whatever the scale is, um, but the technology seems to be developing outside the U.S., at least as far as we can see. Um, basically, at this point in time, we don't have a real good understanding of the, the material properties from th of of 3D printed parts. So they're different enough from traditional manufacturing processes that, that we don't exactly know how they're going to be formed, so that kind of gives us a little bit of concern when we look at things like fatigue failures when we get into metals. You know, I've, I've thrown this out to everybody, everybody else that would listen. You know, if somebody was to make a, a bolt for their lawnmower blade, um, how long would that last? And if you didn't, uh, if you didn't understand the properties, it could fail the first time you turn it on and shoot that blade out from underneath and hurt somebody. Um, so that's one of the thing, one of the really important things. And of course, outside of our industry, there's there, there's a lot of other groups that are extremely concerned about the mechanical properties and the other properties, electrical combustion and fire properties, as well as the emissions of of these products. So, it's there's a lot of work going on. I expect that they're they, they'll get to that point sooner rather than later. But it's still there's a, still a lot of questions that we we have about that. Um, and that kind of leads into the product durability, how long products are going to last. I think I've covered have that. We don't have a good idea of how long they're going to, how long they could last, or how long they're going to fast, or how they're going to fail, like we do with other materials. Education of, of home users, home users, even even the small scale manufacturers, is a is a especially a big challenge because we because of what they the, the, the ease of uh, the ease of production with these with things like toys and stuff, and not understanding the the hazards that are associated with printing toys is how do we make how do we make people understand that if you print out a, a, a small part for, for a child, it could be a choking hazard, that there are regulations that, that you know, from when you buy one in the store that they're required to meet. Um, and, as, and good manufacturing processes, we kind of lose some of that when we get to the home and small manufacturers, is are they using good manufacturing safety processes? Are they, ventil you know, they, they, are they ventilating properly? Are they, are they you know, making sure that the, the environment is clear and safe and if there, there's fire protection issues? And they're, they've properly wired this, this, this printer to make sure that it's not going to overload the electrical circuit or overload the product and cause a fire. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of questions about that. Um, one of the the other the the, um, the other things I wanted to touch on was the open software. The open software problem is that you can get designs anywhere on the internet, and I think we've we've had a couple of pictures of things that have come from open source sourcing, most likely. Um, and it, the way it can possibly circumvent traditional safety and expertise. So you can just print you can print out anything you want. Back to that bolt, you could have somebody that has a small scale. Uh, uh, printer that prints metals, they can print out a bolt that was designed for a really high, strong grade bolt, and they can print out something that you know is not as strong as plastic, and they may not know it because just because they think it's metal is going to be strong, and that may not be the, the, the may not be the case. Um, so um, that that's certainly a concern. Um, supply chain for materials. 
is, is, is an interesting one and how do we maintain that because um, there's a lot that goes into that, that that a lot of people may not understand do you know how do you how do you keep it how do you keep it at the right temperature um, at the right humidity you, you know is, is it getting um, foreign materials in there because you're storing it out in the open and now all of a sudden something's got into it um, and then all that stuff feeds into the finished part and, and it could have an effect on the finished part again it's, it becomes more of a concern the more the more we move from into the the plastics which are generally you know more less load bearing um, into the more structurally structural I guess demanding um, materials such as metal um, yeah, and I just wanted to one, one more time reinforce that the, the ease of this creates a lot of the problems, the ease of the use of it. I mean, everybody is, is really familiar with programs and everything and how they work, and it, it acts pretty much very similar to a home printer. So it doesn't take much of a jump to, to learn the software or to drop a product in there and to start printing out something. So with that, um, um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick, thank you very much for a very exhaustive uh, uh, travel through the world of 3D printing. And as you were talking, it struck me that I can't think of a division within CPSC that wouldn't at some point have some relevance to uh, 3D printing. In that respect, it seems like something that presents the world uh, and consumers with tremendous opportunities, but it carries a lot of risks. Uh, one of the things I was looking at this morning uh, was what, what they call UFPs, which is ultra-fine particles, which is nanotechnology. And the reason I mention that is I gave a talk yesterday to a group, and I said, I used to worry a lot about nanotechnology, but I, I don't worry about it quite as much as I used to. We still have concerns. But what uh, 3D printing brings is new issues relating to ultra-hazardous products. So uh, I do find that uh, as a concern. I guess one of the questions I would ask is, how widespread has 3D printing come into the actual production of products that we buy? And if so, uh, is that taking place in China, or is it still a limited market that it looks like it's going to explode? Do you have any sense of that? Um, I think there's a lot of excitement. I'm not sure how much it's, it's actually percolated into the large manufacturing, mostly because of the limits on production numbers. Um, I think I've heard somewhere somebody say that 10,000 units above that, it's not, it's not effective. It's just not practical. So anything that's below that. So again, I think there's a lot of potential. I think people are trying to find ways to use it. I think there's certain industries that are more suited to use that and to and have started using that. Um, and I think there's certain areas that it, come, but I think it's, I wouldn't say that it, it's kind of a niche, but I would say that it's probably not totally saturated the market yet. There's, there's certainly um, a wide range of industries that are using it from big to small, but um, I'm not really sure and I don't know how to, f without, without them giving us that information because it's not easily, easy to see in a finished product either. So. Um, I, I think that it, it's growing. I think that it, it does represent part of the manufacturing world, but I would say it's probably pretty still relatively small. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was 3D printers that use metal and concrete. Uh, have those found their way into uh, 3D printers that I buy for my home? In other words, you're actually buying a home use 3D printer that can actually use metal as part of its material? So I would say the short answer is yes. You could probably buy one that, that's metal. I think it's, it's a little cost prohibitive. They're a little more expensive. I don't exactly know what the cheapest metal printer you could buy would. I would, I would expect it to be $5,000 or, $5, or greater. So it's not, it's not inconceivable that people have them, especially you know, the, the people that have a hobbyist or something like that have a, a specific purpose to doing that. As far as concrete, I don't think so. I think that is more large scale type stuff for, for Construction type work. I don't know of any applications on a small scale. Why, you know, for, for putting, a, you know, building your own house or something like that, or building a shed. I don't think it's really practical. I think it would be cost prohibitive, and I think it'd be it, the, the the printer that they use is not really. It's not the self-contained printer that you would see on your desk. It, it would be more of a. Um, it, it'd be more of a different, unique-looking 
type of product. I guess I'd never heard of 3D pens until uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, and that 3D pen, I'm looking at page six of the slides, looks to me a lot like a soldering iron, although I'm guessing it's not quite as hazardous. But uh, they uh, can, are we prepared to say that the emissions from 3D pens are not necessarily of concern and that high temperatures not necessarily of concern? Or should people be at least extremely aware of the hazards associated with uh, products like this that sell for 50 bucks? Um, I think I default to I would be, oh, be aware that it's potential. Um, again, that's not that's that's more of Dr. Thomas's area, so I don't, I, I'm not really comfortable speaking too much about that because I don't know enough to, to speak intelligently about it. But um, I would say that basic, that based on the fact that it's most likely putting out plastics, there's the potential for emission hazards, and the fact that as everything else, I don't think in a pen, uh, because of the type of products they'd be printing, they may not reach the temperatures that you would see in a traditional for a whole bunch of reasons, not, not the least of which is the safety of touching it. Yeah. Um, like, a, like I said, a cider, soldering iron. Um, they may not reach those temperatures, so they may not have the emissions problem, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable saying that they, you know, they're totally, they're, that's something that we should totally just discount. Uh, I'll just add in that it is an area of open investigation for us to, to try to get at the, the different emissions from the different levels of printers. Yeah, and uh, you're not from compliance, but I thought I would at least throw the question out. Have we gotten any 15B reports from uh, manufacturers of 3D products, just out of curiosity? No, I was just curious because when you look at them, and there's so many ways that you could have a hazard that pops up that uh, it would be uh, an interesting issue. I think my time is right. Uh, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the staff for the great briefing. Um, I, it's just incredible work that you guys are doing, and I know that there's always a balance at the agency between working on persistent hazards that continue to plague American consumers and then also keeping one eye on the future and what's emerging. And the staff has done excellent work in the past few years on trying to keep one eye on what's emerging and certainly 3D printing would be at the center of that. As we continue to look forward, and uh, the chairman mentioned some of the work in the operating plan for fiscal year 2020, but as we continue to work forward, I would be curious to know, uh, Mr. McCallion, what research in particular that the CPSC staff would recommend be funded by the commission to try to accelerate getting answers on addressing some of the hazards that are of concern, particularly as they would affect children? Um, I think the, the, the emissions would be the, the primary one for now because the ones we're seeing in schools, popping up in schools, um, I don't know if you can see it really well in the, in the picture that we have, is they're open to the environment. There's no, there's no external ventilation or anything like that. And I think they're, they're looking at ways to manage that um, with filtering of some kind. Um, I think it's, it's, it's unlikely that you'd be able to, or un, impractical to, to hook it up to external ventilation like you would in an industrial environment. So I think that's, the, that's kind of the leading uh, concerns we have, so the research that we had mentioned in, in those areas. And is that something that could be potentially uh, teed up in a mid-year project? A proposal to the commission, research related to that. Um, I'd have to I, again. I'd like to talk to Dr. Thomas. I think some of it is actually already being funded, uh, but certainly we'll look at uh, any accelerations uh, as we get closer to mid-year. Do we have any sense as to the budgetary needs for to fund an, an ideal research project to get to this, like a timing and an amount of money? Uh, I think I'd have to get back. Uh, get back to you on that because there are it, it's the different dimensions of this so the emissions is certainly one aspect uh, the durability of the materials and, and sort of the full life cycle durability of materials is something we're just kind of uh, we're just getting our heads around so it's uh, I'd like to get back to you if it's that's possible okay that'd be great and then there's nothing like the equivalent of NNI in this space I know that there's interagency work but is there anything even remotely as formalized as that of agencies really um, prioritizing what needs to be looked at and 
uh, assigning that out to the agencies with the best expertise or is it much more informal? Um, I think that may be sort of what Trey is at right at the moment. Um, I'm not totally familiar with the conference he's at. I don't think mechanically there is anything close to that. Again, this, it's mechanically, from a mechanical standpoint, it's kind of lagging a little bit behind the emissions. Is, is the, the, that area is a little bit more advanced. I think they picked up on those issues a little sooner. The mechanical people are just, you know, they're a little slower picking up on, on the issues, but I think they'll get, the, we, we may get there. Okay, that's great. And you know, we would continue to rely on the staff to have an ear to the ground to let us know what we really need to be paying attention to and funding and raising concerns about whether it's trying to push for more voluntary standards work, because it sounds like there could be gaps in the voluntary standards, as well as any other actions that the Commission could take. So we appreciate it very much. Thank you. No further questions. Commissioner Biaco. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the work on this. I love this stuff. And I really appreciated your briefing. And um, I, I thank you for your, for your good work and continued work on this and, and, and to the whole team. Um, I see this as having two silos, if you will. Um, there are the printers themselves, over which, uh, to the extent they're defined as a consumer product, we have jurisdiction and the issues that are associated with the printer themselves, printer itself and then all the products that are coming out of this printer. So uh, let me start there, because my first question is, um, do we have a, an, an idea of how we are going to, or how we're looking at this from which, which printer or printers are, should be classified as consumer versus industrial? I read something along the way where uh, they, uh, there was some classification, if it was above $5,000, it was considered industrial versus consumer. I, I would imagine that that's going to develop into something more, um, more substantive than just how much it cost. Yes, I think that's a, that's a really good question, and it's a really hard one to answer because of the crossover. Like I said, you got $5,000 uh, printers or less that are that would fit on your tabletop that would be that are with the, the ease of use are certainly fit within the, the consumer's grasp of being able to operate them um, and they're being put on on industrial manufacturing floors in a big line because they can then increase their numbers so I think it's it's it's, it's an interesting question and in how you would do that um, cost I, I can see the the cost or the size would be two two ways of trying to do that but again, I, because of the crossover that, of, of purpose, I don't know how that would really work out. How, and it's certainly something that we, I know is that, that um, people that are dealing with terminology and stuff are looking at from those type of stuff. Is how, do we do, how do we differentiate the two? Uh, we can't, I mean, it, we, it has to be a consumer product first before, before we take steps, right? And, and the, I think it would be at some point on the, the ends of the spectrum be easy to determine well, this definitely is not going to be industrial, or, or at least right now. Um, but your point about the small businesses is well taken. You could have a $5,000, if you will, uh, printer open up in, uh, in your basement and, and print out a component part, which then goes into a global supply chain that we then have, maybe not over the printer, or we may or may not, but then we have jurisdiction over what's coming out, the component or, or the product. So I, I, I don't if you can direct me, if you know any background on how to make that distinction. Um, I, I'm, I've been struggling with that one myself, but I, I find it incredibly, just the whole thing fascinating. So putting that aside for a second, I, um, I wrote so many things down. I'm just gonna try to jump around a little bit um, and I could be here all day, so I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Um, so I'm gonna ask the, the basic questions, because a lot of the things that you raise are uh, issues that the CPSC deals with all the time, right? You know, uh, plastics and emission well not necess not necessarily emissions but choking parts uh, choking hazards and, and so forth um, do you know of um, any injury data that's out there as far as products that have injured um, consumers uh, that were that came out of a, a, a 3d printer and do we want to get a nice code for that you know, where do we start with getting that type of data um, I, I and another interesting question. I think that identifying 3D printed parts or products is difficult in itself. You have to actually. That's my next question. <laughs> right. Um, so that would be the first thing. I don't think that we have any, any, anything that specifically was identified as a 3D part or product that I know of that, that came in as an incident. 
Um, and I think part of that reason is it's hard to identify unless somebody unless somebody was to physically print it and tell us that. Or that the, the, the printer hurt them. Or the printer, right? I think we. Ha I think I. I'm, I think I have heard that we've had a couple of printer-related incidents with printers, either fire or electrical hazards type of thing. Um, I've seen I, some sharp edges too here and there. Right, right. That's certainly a concern with the, the roughness, especially with the the um, less expensive printers are going to print out pretty rough surfaces. So you could have it, and again, if you start printing out metal parts with rough with rough surfaces on it, certainly going to have sharp edges at sharp points. Your point, um, your example about the bolt. It was, it was a very good one. Um, do we have, or uh, I mean, how do you put in best practices to determine uh, the parts that are going to be mixed in? Uh, how, how do you know? I mean, how do you know? Uh, another hard question to answer. It's it's um, with especially with things like open source uh, availability of, of designs. It's just I, I don't know if there's a good way currently to do that. Um, my thought was maybe there's a, a, a software or software with the, you know, with doing that, but it's more likely, I would say, if, if anything could be done, it may be done with the printers, kind of like um, a printer detecting if it's genuine ink or not. If there's something that's obvious, then it would be, but... Mike just no asked way. me that question. Was there anything that, like, a, a printer doesn't recognize currency? Is there any type of program that could go into the 3D printer that would recognize, you know, you can program it, for example, to make sure that the bolt that's coming out, whether it's plastic or metal, is consistent with the standard. I, I, I wonder if that's available. I, I think in, in the future, maybe. Right now, I would say no. That's not available. The um, federal interagency meeting, are you involved in that? Um, there was a, a slide that mentioned we hosted or somebody hosted a federal interagency meeting on, on August 20th. I, yeah, that was Dr. Thomas. Oh, okay. I, I would just, I wanted to follow up with that and see what issues um, we're, we're looking at specifically. Um, how about that I'm jumping around here. Explosion hazard is another one. Back in my old days, uh, my old life, I had a case um, that was a sawdust explosion that was sparked by a spark. So I, when you were given that example, I can see that being a real hazard. Um, how do we prioritize these hazards? <laughs> I'm sorry. So uh, a great question. So the uh, as um, Rick kind of glossed over at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the risk management group was uh, uh, rebranded a couple of years ago and refocused on doing just that on, in terms of uh, looking at some of these emerging hazards, but also characterizing uh, what uh, the risks that we're seeing. Uh, and so they've recently uh, developed what's called P2. Uh, uh, to help uh, assess uh, likelihood and consequence information, risk reduction, and, and get at uh, what risk are we seeing in, in various consumer products. I would be, just be interested in that because I, I can't get my little head around wh how many issues that I can see coming down the pike, some that don't apply to the CPSC, but th there are definitely um, a lot of issues. I'm going to go back to one. You gave me so many good examples. You talked about the temperatures and processes um, during manufacturing, for example, plastics. Do we know how um, a 3D printer processes, let's just say plastics at a, at, at a temperature, how that's compared to traditional uh, manufacturing? In other words, does a 3D printer have to raise the temperature to 100 degrees, whereas um, regular man uh, traditional manufacturing only has to go to 50 degrees? Uh, those are bad numbers. but. I'd say we got a pretty good idea of that. I don't have that information right here, and yeah. I think it's. I think it would depend on the process, um, as to how high they raised it. But I, I think that there's a pretty good understanding of what that, what those temperatures are. Okay, and then we can compare that to a traditional manufacturing, because I'm guessing, I'm just guessing, that the processes that are used, you know, when you change temperature and, and properties and so forth, that gives you a different result. And I, I I'm guessing that there could be safety related issues on one form of the you know, additive manufacturing as opposed to the subtractive, um, I think that's what it's called, right? Sub subtractive right. Uh, manufacturing. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I would I would say tentatively that that they would probably try to keep the temperatures relatively similar. But one of the problems again with 3D printing is the the local temperature and the cooling effect. So that you have you have temperature related variables that that are that are in 3D printing that you may not have with an injected molded part where they can keep the temperature constant throughout the whole you know around the whole mold mm -hmm. basically. Whereas 3D pr 3D printing you have that temperature at that spot, but it tends to cool as the the, the jet would move away. So mm -hmm. um, I would think that on the, on the um, they would try to keep them the same. What those are, I could find out. We could talk specific yeah, processes, like but, like um, but um, th there, there also may be some differences based on the process. Okay. I'm going to stop there because, um, I, I, like I said, I could go on all day, but this is fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm fascinated, and I was uh, hanging on all of your questions and found them incredibly interesting. Uh, does Commissioner Feldman have any questions that you wanted to pass on? Commissioner Feldman is on the line. And oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Please weigh in. And I want to thank everybody first for uh, everyone's hard work in putting today's presentation uh, together and thank uh, uh, Commissioner Adler in particular for making arrangements to, for me to participate remotely. Uh, I am recovering Especially from surgery. Especially now that we can hear you. And would, uh, you can hear me. We can. It's terrific. Okay. Terrific. Uh, otherwise, I, 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 would, I would very much love to be there in person. Um, my uh, question, uh, and I only have a couple of them, <clears throat> the first one has to do with the discussion that, uh, that we were having about uh, the application of defense and aerospace standards to home commercial uh, uh, 3D printing units. Has there any thought been paid to the impact on price and availability of these types of units if these types of sort of advanced and industrial standards were applied to these particular consumer products? Um, I, I'd venture to say that uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the processes they use are, are fairly expensive and the materials certainly because the, the main focus I think from the aerospace, um, not so much, I don't think as much DOD, but aerospace is, has a very big interest in titanium. Um, so I'm not totally sure if, if the process is as expensive as the material is, but I think those are, again, they're, because of the tight, the tight specs that are required for, for aerospace, especially flight, flight uh, parts or flight uh, directed apart parts, um, that, that they're, not, they're certainly not looking at cost. And I'm not sure if that technology has really gotten down to where it's affordable yet. I'm, I think as they use it more, as, it, as they, it, it kind of moves along, moves down the line and, and make it cheaper. But I would say right now, it's probably not in the realm of the, the general consumer. Um, but, but no one's I, talking about applying standards that may have uh, be, be, be appropriately placed in terms of that kind of specialty manufacturing. Uh, that, that, that no one's suggesting that, that it may, in fact, be appropriate to apply DOD or aerospace standards to uh, a uh, consumer home unit. Yeah, this is Dwayne Bobbis. No, that that was not uh, that is not the intent. I, I think when when we were talking about the DoD and aerospace, we were looking to learn from their applications. Some some of their lessons learned. Uh, they've been sort of the leading edge of uh, of some of this technology. But we're not. Looking okay, at I appreciate that because one of my biggest fears and and one of my biggest concerns that was raised during that 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 conversation is that we did not take steps that needlessly raise costs on these units uh, that provide for sort of fewer uh, uh, choices of 3D printers in, in, in the marketplace uh, because of the impact that, that, uh, that this u these units are having on STEM and participation uh, in, 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 in these types of activities by, you know, school groups and, and, and children uh, and, and because of the sort of various benefits that, that these devices offer, uh, I think, I think, uh, I, 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 I think it's, Something that we would view skeptically and, and, and with an extreme amount of caution that we uh, that, that we not apply standards that are sort of appropriate for other applications, the consumer application. Uh, the next question that I have has to do with the discussion about uh, emissions. Um, how does the CPSC make a determination about whether whether we would be the appropriate agency for being an emissions regulator with respect to 3D printing in these processes versus, for example, the the EPA. 
If I might, that sounds like a legal question uh, in addition to a technical question. I'll leave it to the technical staff to tell, help us understand uh, where you draw the line on those, but at some point it probably is a legal question in addition. Uh, so this is Dwayne Boffis. I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, uh, certainly, as, uh, as we noted, many of our efforts in this area have been joint with EPA and others, and uh, really we're all kind of working our way around this rather new problem. Uh, our focus is very much at the specific consumer product level. EPA typically takes those at a broad kind of cross-cutting approach, uh, but it would really kind of be more at a case-by-case -case basis. And I'll turn it over to Gib. I'd okay. Be I'd be happy to discuss that question, uh, but I think that um, it there are uh, there is some statutory rules that limit our jurisdiction in this area. Um, a lot of times, though, I would agree 100% with what Twain just said that we work out cooperatively with the other agency how we will deal with things, and uh, there are there certainly is uh, an area of jurisdiction for us in this. Uh, we're not prohibited from regulating emissions in appropriate circumstances. So it's a, it's a, it's a I would just put on the table for consideration that EPA has uh, perhaps more history and more familiarity with regulating emissions than the CPSC, uh, and, and therefore I think it would be important that we sort of keep a clear eye on where that, that, that uh, jurisdictional line exists, including if there are actually statutory prohibitions on, on, on where we can go and paying attention to emissions. I can agree with that. Those are my questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Peter. And I don't have too many questions. I did want to uh, just raise a concern that I think Commissioner Biacco put her finger on, and that is, and that you did as well, and that is uh, my nightmare is uh, consumers acting as manufacturers. If somebody's producing stuff uh, that they get downloaded from open source and they're not warned about don't use these kinds of materials and don't make it with sharp edges and sharp points. Uh, it would be a fascinating exercise just to look at the definition of a consumer product and see how far our jurisdiction would go, but I, I'm not so much worried about that as I am just worried about the hazards that would be out in the marketplace. Um, how widespread, if you have any idea, is the amount of open source materials that people use to download, to use with their home 3D printers? Is it voluminous? Is it growing, exploding? I would say generally it's pretty widespread. Um, as far as growing, I'm not sure it's, it's growing any faster than anything else. I think it's... Well, <laughs> it scares me. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I, but I think it's, if you wanted something a, a, a part you could probably find it. Um, there may be some areas that are more <laughs> that have that have more interest in doing stuff like that. I mean, there um, uh, the novelty stuff is probably pretty common. Um, there's there's specialty interest stuff. I heard uh, anecdotally that um, <coughs> model railroaders have a lot of interest in this. So there's probably a lot in that area. Automotive for old cars. There are a whole bunch of those type of areas. Um, but I ex any specific areas that are growing or anything. And I, I, I'm would say generally that is. You, you mentioned the possibility of somebody hacking into a connected device that's a 3D printer. Uh, how common do you think they, they are in the market that are actually connected uh, 3D printers? And is this something that's likely to expand? I can think of other devices I'd rather have connected than my 3D printer, but you tell me. So I would say, I would venture to say that they're virtually all connected oh, no in some kidding. way, shape, or form, wow. right? That's just the way things operate, like a printer would be. Um, so they they're have some kind of connectivity because they, they will need to communicate between your computer or your programming oh, and that's the good printer. Point. So they're, they're doing that. As far as being vulnerable to attack, I'm not sure what kind of security they have on there or how, how if anybody has found it, but hackers are pretty creative. I wouldn't be surprised if they decided to. Um, for, my guess would be something like a denial of service type of thing because there's probably not enough to, to warrant somebody to go after individual ones. I'm not an IT person, but... Um, I would definitely go with their most likely connected at least. The I could see a horror movie of somebody taking over printer and printing out the killer robot that attacks everybody in the home, but uh, hopefully that's, uh, that's far away. Uh, those are all my questions at the moment. Commissioner Biacco, back to you. 
Thank you. Um, I, I don't have any additional questions um, for this here. I, as I mentioned, I have a bunch going forward. If, if just on the on your point about the con connectivity, it, it, I might be wrong about this, but it's my understanding that the anything that's wireless that provides the mechanism to hack into something that's um, connected, if you will. Um, so I, I think that that's one issue. But I think that of all the things you can hack into. Because I don't, I don't want to create the robot to kill somebody in the middle of the night. It, it would seem like it wouldn't be a, it, 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 this day and age, it wouldn't be the, the, the biggest target. But certainly, long, long down the road, it certainly could very well be. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, do you have any other questions? I, I have no additional questions, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this does strike me, just thinking out loud, about uh, we probably ought to be thinking about doing some kind of fact sheet for, for the world, uh, given the array of hazards and with the rapidly expanding use of these devices, just something general to say, <laughs> think about what you're breathing, think about what you're plugging it into, think about your fire potential, think about the nature of the chemicals that are put into it. It's just a broad array of issues. So. Uh, I hope we never get to this, but I could see this becoming as big a concern uh, in some respects as the IOT issues that we have, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed that this will not rise to that level. I do want to thank you so much for a truly outstanding presentation, uh, and uh, thank you again, and I'm going to wish the Nats well in their game tonight.